Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin. I uh, work for Protocol Labs on standards and governance. Uh, before I start, I want to give a shout out to the AV team who just like fixed laptop <laughs> slides issue in like no time. So thanks. That, that was really great. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, quick question. Who here knows what the web is? No one. Great. <laughs> DJ has an idea. You know. You know. That, well, great. You, you came to the right talk. Um, obviously. So we'll 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 get to that um, at some point, a little bit later, in a few slides. Um, but before that, is anyone here slightly more serious question uh, familiar with you know the 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 political movement known as technocracy uh, and the goal of like creating a North American technet uh, in the early 20th century? No, you don't. Well, great. Let's do a little bit of history. Um, so there was this movement um, in the 1930s, so it's not a great time for political movements in general. Um, it was predominantly um, North American, though it had ramifications elsewhere. Um, and basically their idea uh, was to replace democracy uh, with technocracy. It's a society you know, ruled by technological elit elitism. Uh, it's a very rationalist program. The idea was that you know, democracy, like people make stupid decisions because you know, they're just like people. Whereas if you put like proper engineers in charge, then they'll figure things out and like, do, it, do it right. Um, it's basically thought of the way they conceptualized it uh, is really a science of social engineering. Um, uh, you know, basically, the, you, you really get to this this um, scientific organization uh, of society, and it, it 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 looks exactly like like what it sounds like. If you look at the the diagram all the way to to the, to the right there, that's how you organize the entire the entirety of society. You have like this big, you know, um, the, the the continental board that's running everything from Canada to somewhere in the middle of Mexico. I'm not sure why they drew the line there, um, and it's got like four directorates of sorts, and then there's a whole bunch of like uh, area directors. Um, uh, one of them is Recreations, which I think that that must be a hilarious guy running Recreations for the entirety of North America. That, that, that's a job, right? Um, and so, uh, but really their, their idea was that, you know, the, the price system um, has flaws and doesn't really run society well, which is, which is correct. And politicians have flaws and don't run society well, which is also correct. Um, business people don't, you know, have flaws and don't run society well, which I, I also agree with. And then, so we're going to have engineers run everything because engineers are perfect and they, they really think through things rationally. Um, yeah, I mean, some people can have that opinion, but it's, you know, superficially, it's true that, that they, these folks really don't look good. Um, they had uniforms, again, in the 1930s. Um, but it's, it's interesting to, to, to look at, at their values and their belief system, right? They, one thing that's very clear is that they undervalue complexity. They really think that the more you can normalize things and, and standardize them, uh, the better things will work at, at every level of society. Um, they really believed in, in, a, in a sort of like universal ranking of values so that you can organize all of the information of the entire society of an entire continent and run it, you know, um, uh, rationally. Um, they also believed, and this is, this is an interesting thing, that people wanted well-being more that, than they wanted agency. And so, you know, basically if you're well-fed, you don't necessarily care what you eat, um, or you're not going to be interested in cooking or discovering new things, if so, so long as you have enough to eat. Which you know, we'll we'll, we'll return to that idea. And <laughs> it's easy to make fun of them at, at a distance, right? They, I mean, their favorite color was gray. That was that was the normalized color of everything. They had this motorcade to promote the movement that drove from I think somewhere in California all the way up to Vancouver, and they painted every car gray. They, they bought a school bus, you know, the, the American yellow school buses, and they painted it gray. They had gray uniforms with gray shoes. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a whole, it's a whole vibe. And basically, they branded themselves in a way that if someone wrote a young adult novel with those guys in it, you'd go like, come on. <laughs> That's a little bit on the nose, right? There's, there's, there's villains, really? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a bit exaggerated. Um, so, but I really think we should be a bit careful before we make fun um, of that movement because, you know, under, under the vision and under the weird and bad branding, um, you know, sometimes ideas can survive 
in other shapes and can keep permeating uh, the world. And so if these people are so obviously, I mean, I, I see everyone uh, smiling and yet going like, well, what, what the hell were those guys thinking? You know, if they're so obviously evil and laughable, then you know, why is it that we've chosen to live in that world? Why is it that we've built society and organized everything in a way that is entirely uh, according to technocratic principles? This is how we've organized the web, the internet, uh, pretty much ent the entirety of the digital world runs this way. This is the world we're in. This is the world we built. Um, so, you know, many of us have been around a while and, you know, many of us have seen this coming a while and we're not without power, right? There are lots of people in this room who can, like, make things, talk to people, influence things, and yet, you know, why could we not stop it? Why did this happen? We saw it coming. It's here. Um, this isn't what we set out to build. And so, I don't know, we wanted to empower people. Um, we, you know, we, we, we instead they, they all became corralled into these choice architectures at massive scales. Um, you know, we wanted to get rid of gatekeepers. I remember that the early days of the web, we were like, oh, no more gatekeepers, you know, fuck the gatekeepers. And instead of having like 10,000 gatekeepers, which we thought was too much, uh, which we, we thought was a problem, we now have like two or three. Um, which is way worse. Um, that, is not, that is not progress. We have much stronger gatekeepers. Um, so, you know, why, why did we fail? Um, and I think, you know, at least part of my theory, the way I'm trying to explain that to myself and also trying to figure out how to, how to solve it, is that we weren't clear enough on what we wanted to do, where we wanted to go. It was a, sort of a, an exciting movement, but without a clear objective. And also, we sort of had somewhat naive ideas of, of like good and evil and how to make good in the world. And you know, technocracy is not inherently evil. I think it's wrong, but I don't think it's evil. Like, you know, if you look, if you look at that, like they were thinking of like universal basic income in the 30s. Um, that, that, is, that is pretty advanced thing, and it's, it's in many ways pro-social. I have no idea why they picked up big evil looking robot to defend that but um you know again bad branding but <laughs> underlying ideas um and the thing is like it, 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 they they really wanted to bring prosperity to everyone uh, they just thought that people weren't very good at knowing what's good for themselves and that engineers would do it better uh, because engineers have data and data of course means good decisions right um and so <laughs> No, but I mean, that is, that is the idea. And, so, you know, they, they wanted good, but they believed in a very hierarchical, um, rationalist ordering, you know, unique ordering, data-driven uh, ordering of society. And that, that is the world that, that we're in, 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 in the digital environment. And so I think it's time to take a deep breath, not just now, but like collectively and, 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 and over the coming times, and really try to understand what it is that we're trying to do with this web, with this digital environment, um, and not just like fixing small things in small corners, but like really having a clearer view of where we want to go so that we can be more effective in, in getting there. And I do think there's cohesion in what people want, uh, especially in this community. So, you know, we got it wrong. Um, but if we figure out where we're going, can we, can we really fix it? Or is it too late? Or, you know, is, is this now a time where we just like maybe give up and just like figure out that this is how it's going to be and we can make the best of it? There's a lot of people, um, notably in, in web standards in, and in browsers, uh, who keep repeating to me that, uh, I don't know if you've read this, this book from uh, Tim Wu, The Master Switch, where basically he explains that pretty much every information-based industry since, I forget where he starts, but a while ago, uh, turns into a monopoly. Uh, so since the telegraph, thank you, uh, turn, turns, turns in, eventually turns into a monopoly. And so this is what's going to happen to us, and therefore the best we can do is to try to have a gentle giant, some kind of benevolent dictator, benevolent monopoly over, over the web and, and the internet and the entirety of the digital um, sphere. That's not what Tim Wu thinks. He's working in antitrust these days, so presumably he, he doesn't believe that's the conclusion, but a lot of people think that it's hopeless and that's the only thing we can do. But I think it's actually fixable for two reasons. I think it's fixable because we must fix it. Um, if, we, you know, if we live in, a, in an entirely technocratic uh, society, 
we will be living in a society that's too simplistic and too naive for the kind of collective action problems that we need to fix uh, at, you know, in a planetary polycrisis. And also, I think that we actually can fix it. In the 90s, in the early 2000s, we lacked quite a few primitives in terms of um, technology and in terms of understanding how digital governance can succeed. Uh, you know, we had, we, we had examples like Wikipedia, Mozilla, open source blogs, RSS, all of that happened at once. And we're like, oh, OK, we got this sorted out. Oh, there's tons of good stuff happening. Uh, clearly, we understand how this works. Um, but we didn't. Not everything works. And we didn't, we didn't have the understanding of why the things that were successful were successful and why some of them uh, weren't. But today, we have better social um, and better technical tools uh, emerging, and they, they can work together. So, OK, can, maybe we can get to the question of like what the web thing is. Um, now, you know, it, it's kind of weird, but this is something that we actually never figured out. Um, there may, several groups actually tried to write down the definition of the web. You know, that the, I, I know in W3C, like several iterations of groups were like, yeah, we should, we should actually tell people what the web is, right? We keep talking about it and we have it in the acronym and stuff, uh, but like we don't have a definition and they always failed. And the reason, the reason people fail is that it's actually a bit confusing if you try to do it in a, in a sort of like too immediate um, manner because the, cap, the tech keeps changing, right? The, the way we did the web um, 20 years ago and the way we're doing the web today are, are very different. Like if you compare HTTP 0.9 to HTTP 3, those are like worlds apart. Uh, there's some semantics that have been connected between the two, but you go from something that doesn't even have headers and can only transmit HTML to something that, that is uh, binary, UDP, yada, yada, um, has a world of complexity. HTML has changed completely over. Um, XML, um, you know, was so horrible that we now have JSX everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, the whole thing keeps being reinvented. There was a time when, when Firefox ran on RDF, if, you, if you'll believe that, at least the extension system. Um, so, you know, it's, you, you can't, like, pick a list of technologies and say these things are the web. And also, like, some web stuff is used in non-web context and some non-web things are used on the web. Um, so it's a bit, it's a bit difficult. Some, some have suggested that we should just say that the web is browsers. It's what runs in browsers. But that means that the web is like IE6 and Chrome. Is that how we're going to define this thing? I think, I think we can do a little bit better. One way of thinking slightly beyond browsers, I think this is a good idea of browsers because the technical term for browsers is user agents. And it's software that is there to work on behalf of the user and represent the user in the world. And I think that's a good first step. It gives us a clue. Um, we've had user agents from the day one. We've had user agents ever since. And I actually think that that is how we get to a definition of the web. The web is the set of network technologies that work to increase user agency. It packs uh, quite a few things in a single sentence, but I think from that, um, we can actually expand and define what it is we want to do and how we want to get there. Um, so the web is about agency, and you can see that this is sort of true and has been true from the start. Even hypertext, the idea of hypertext itself, is sort of like helping break people out of the linearity of text. You, you, you're reading something, and at some point, you can go somewhere else. And really, in the initial idea of, of hypertext, it wouldn't have to be an author-provided link. You could like click on the word and go somewhere else that was related to that word. Um, there, were, there were much more, much richer ideas of, of hypertext initially. CSS, same thing. It was meant to have user style sheets so that you could override the bad taste of people who make websites. Um, and, you know, it, 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 in a sense, it, it's, it, 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 this, could, this is something that can be used to evaluate tech. You can look at a, a piece of new technology and you, you can think, is this thing increasing the agency of people uh, or not? A lot of the time you're going to find that the answer is not. The answer is likely to, to be, oh, it's going to save you some time. But what are you trading off in exchange for that time? Like, for instance, if you had technology that cooked for you, okay, that sounds, that sounds fine. You know, maybe you don't want to cook or you don't want to cook every meal. So you want some, you know, some piece of technology to do it for you. But when you do that, what are you trading off in exchange for it? 
Well, maybe you're trading off control over what you're eating, and initially it's going to be fine, but over time as all of your neighbors adopt the same technology, you no longer have going to have a grocery store in your area. You're no longer have going to have access to things that enable, enable you to cook for yourself when you want to or if you want to. And eventually the quality is going to go down as the market is captured, and you're going to like eat shittier and shittier things um, just because there's now no alternative to it. This is exactly how those time-saving technologies have worked. And so time-saving is not in and of itself an, incre uh, an improvement to, to, to agency. We need things that enable people to do more. Um, and so in a sense, it's not that browsers are bad, it's that they're not browser enough, they're not user agents enough. Okay, we have a definition, that's a start. Um, and I'm realizing that I put my timer to 25 hours instead of 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> is, that, that, is that good, Dietrich? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Hey, are, you, are, you, are you in for another like 24 hours and change? Yeah, great. Um, so we have a definition, but does it mean anything concrete? You know, can, we, how, can it help decide how we build things? So first, I think... It, it's, it's important to tie this to real practical philosophy. And there's something called the capabilities approach uh, that, that um, Amartya Sen and uh, Martha uh, Nussbaum have been uh, working on. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, it's useful to tie th these things to a philosophy because it means we don't have to make everything up. We can refer to a, a pre-existing work that has like solved some of these problems. And you know, this approach was designed to help with human development. Uh, the idea is that, you know, in, especially like in the 70s and 80s, uh, people were like, oh, the third world, well, that, that's, that's kind of terrible. Like we, we colonized and imperialized them and like underdeveloped them and maybe we should help people there. And so what folks did is they brought, they came there, they dropped food, because like, hey, you, you need, Food, you know, here's, here's food. And of course, if you just like dump food in a market, you're destroying the local capacity for farming, you're destroying the local capacity for markets uh, to like really, you know, all the things that can help people um, uh, grow out of, of, of poverty, you're actually destroying them. And that means you, you have to keep bringing food. And so these folks started figuring out we need a different way, we need a different mental approach of thinking about how to you know, enable people uh, to, 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 to do things for themselves. And really, the idea of the capabilities approach is it's meant to be very concrete to um, not work on vaporware freedom, but actual uh, freedom that's designed to be measurable. It's, all, it's, what you're, uh, it's about what you're able to do and what you're able to, to be. And even though it's focused on individual agency, it's not an individualistic approach, because the one key idea is that individual agency is really grounded in collective action. The reason that you're able to do something as a person and that you have more capabilities as a person is because you live in a society that supports you in doing that. And the idea that is that from there you can build a virtuous cir uh, circle of like, you know, having more agency for people who can use that agency to improve the collective, that in turn improves uh, agency for people. And so, you know, philosophy is fun. Uh, I mean, at least I think so. Um, refining the web project is interesting, but what does this look like in, in practice? So I don't have demos yet. I hope that next year can, we can come back with demo. Maybe Fabrice will be showing a, a few, few things, or at least screenshots. Um, but, you know, a core practical aspect is that in the traditional web, the power is with the server. And so the best you can hope for in a client-server architecture is benevolent dictatorship. It's always a dictatorship, and you can hope that it's benevolent because the, the server has um, the power. And that is basically you know, uh, the, the offering of technocracy. That is a, a, a software architecture that is designed uh, for technocracy. And so we need to move intelligence and composability over to the client so that people can have greater power, and that works in um, the user agent. And so just a few high-level ideas, not developed yet, but high-level ideas of, 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 what, of what we can do. Like first, we, could, we should be turning um, search and social into protocols. It's you know, browsing on the web, searching, finding stuff on social, relying on curated feeds. They're all just ways of discovering content. And this should be happening on people's own agents. Search and social are really the same thing. Uh, they're just like algorithmic media that's either push or pull, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of weird that we don't have a unified interface to these things because they're all like one way of finding content. And you can imagine that that content should be like little tiles 
of, of, of pages and that you might have like a feed that's search results and a feed that's social and a feed that's like your own local curated feed and like you can like drag one, drag from one to the other, put the content there and maybe that shares it to social because your feed is public. All of these things actually work really well with content addressable, um, uh, you know, web, web, web data. If you put like your, your web pages on IPFS, you can easily move them around locally because they can't address, it doesn't matter, republish them, reshare them. Blue Sky is doing things in that, in that direction, and I think we can, we can move forward um, with, with quite a few ideas there. Um, same thing, you know, if we move more control to the client, we can move a lot of the recommendation engine to the client. You can just like run some, run some WASM um, locally. If you make sure that it can't hit the network, then it can't betray your privacy. And you can just like have each of these feeds, give it, here's a bag of like, you know, pages, rank them for me, put them in an order that I will like. You don't like the recommendation engine, just swap it for another one. And this can really help solve issues in um, algorithmic monoculture, having, you know, the, the way in which like Spotify has been shown to like unify music tastes across like a lot of people. Um, and then you can also apply your same preferences to search and to social and to curated feeds. You can bring your own content moderation. This means that you have your own client side system that can do like block party across everything. Um, and you can also see the world through other people's eyes by using their recommendations. So there's quite a few things we can do this. And also another thing that's core to agency is like finding new ways of building apps. Like, you know, apps themselves, monolithic apps, have been a bad idea for a long time. People don't actually want to use apps. They want to get things done, and they want to plug pieces of apps together. Um, and so porting monolithic apps to the web is actually not helping anyone much. Uh, like, no one goes like, yeah, I love this monolithic app. If only it could be an inside a tab to make it even like less usable than it already is. That is not the way to do web apps, right? What we want is like use the web approach of like, how do I enable agency? Well, people have tasks that they want to do. They have activities that they want to do. You can use things like web activities, web intents. These are new APIs. I'm a, not new anymore. Novel. APIs that haven't been used much, but that allow people to express an intent, or at least via one, you know, one app to express an intent that triggers another one that is how you want it handled. So you could say, edit this picture, and your own picture editor comes up and then returns the, returns the edited picture to, to, to the original thing. So you basically can have links of activities that turn into app-like things, and so we make apps more like the web rather than the other way around. Um, because it turns out people like links. And also, again, bringing this to the client side means you can compose things much more easily because you can't really compose remote things unless you're really in love with like, uh, you know, soap and whistle and that kind of stuff. And I know that's Dietrich's, you know, uh, love of his life, uh, the, you know, but, but for the rest of us, it's probably not the right thing. Another thing, and this one is unpopular, people generally hate it, is that I really think we should have protocols for advertising uh, that make advertising user-centric. Why and how does this help user agency? Well, society allocates $600 billion a year to various services using advertising. I don't think this is something that we should, you know, not control that, you know, as, as a society. Um, and a lot of this is essential to the functioning of, of democracy. So, you know, we, I think we should really have a, have a say in that. That's, that's, you know, ballpark the US military budget. Um, and so, uh, you know, this can be used to pay for search. It can be used to pay for browsers. Right now, browsers don't have a business model other than selling eyeballs to search and enforcing search dominance. Um, so uh, we, we, we can really use this to improve privacy in advertising and limit ad size and give people control over the ads they get. Um, and that's actually how the remote control was invented. It was as a way of shutting down the sound on annoying TV ads. You had to point this kind of like light thing at the corner of the TV and it would switch off the sound. Has anyone heard of like LLMs and AI? <laughs> um, okay, yeah, some people have been paying attention. So, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna build a better AI on the spot here, but just to give an example of how thinking from user agency and thinking from these web principles can help us improve things. 
I really think that having a singleton worldwide oracle, you know, addressing all of our information needs is the, I mean, it's really the most boring and technocratic idea that I can think of in terms of like, how do you want to make intelligence, synthetic intelligence happen? Um, and if you want to think about like, how would we go about like, forgetting whether it's technically feasible today, but how would we go about building, you know, similar systems of, of, uh, um, of in synthetic intelligence for people with user agency in mind? Well, you would want everyone to have their own, not access to a big centralized one. And you would want the, their own to like pay attention to your utterances, what you write, what you do, learn from that, not share it with anyone else. And because there's no such thing as individual intelligence. We are all smart to the extent that we have a good epistemic network that we can rely on. You would want those like personal symbiotic, basically um, AIs to like peer to peer connect to your friends and ask questions of their um, personal AIs when they can't figure something out or just to get advice for, from others. That's one way, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm gonna build it tomorrow morning, even though it's, it's kind of tempting to hack on these things. Um, but you know, it's one way of thinking of how we could change and challenge these technologies to make them more web-like and more human-like. Now, uh, is this just a simple matter of programming? Can we just like swap the way out of this? It's a bit difficult. There's entrenched power, very, very deeply entrenched uh, technocracy. Um, and, you know, we'll get to reasons why I think this can work. But first, I'd like to look at like three quick obstacles. The first is that we tend to think about capture resistance in a way that I think is unhelpful. There's this uh, sort of like wishful hope that if we find the perfect decentralized architecture, then we'll be fine. Everyone will be free. That's not how it works. The people who don't want um, you know, the world to be decentralized work every day, day and night to recapture things. And so the, the, I think the be a better frame to approach this with is really through a cybersecurity frame where like attackers, you know, attackers will come at you all the time and you have to constantly think of new ways of updating your defenses and protecting the system. You really want to have capture resistance as a constant practice constantly updating things. There's no perfect architecture. There's only like continuous ways of pushing back. Another thing is that any technology that mediates human interactions directly or, or indirectly is actually creating a form of institution. It's a system of rules that coordinates uh, human behavior and the resources that we manage together. And the, the communities working on um, institutions and the communities working on technology don't currently communicate enough. There's some but not, not enough. Like tech people generally don't realize that they're building institutions and, and institution analysis people often don't know enough about the actual uh, possibilities of tech. It's changing, but, but, but not fast enough. And so that's the study of like Eleanor Ostrom and she spent decades uh, on this. And you know, if you ask tech people about like forms of governance, they'll be like, well, there's dictatorship, some vague voting thing ish and then just like punt to the territorial state. I can guarantee that she, she spent those decades working on a little bit more than that. Um, and that's just one researcher. And so if we, you, you know, we, 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 we need to bridge these communities more. Um, also one thing that is um, uh, difficult is that UI is actually hard. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of progress in cryptographic primitives. There's been a lot of progress in protocol design. Uh, the infrastructure is better, but if we port bad UI that's not helpful for user agency to new tech, we're not going to get uh, better things. So if, you're, if your wallet is an app store, then you have an app store on decentralized tech, which is not great. Um, you know, people don't change defaults. So if you use defaults to capture a market the way that search does in browsers, then you're not making things better no matter what infrastructure it runs on. So, you know, uh, we have an idea of what we want and, and you know, uh, how can we make this fix? How, how, how can, what, what areas um, give me hope that we, can, that, that we can move this forward? One area is that the, you know, the growth of cooperative computing. Um, you know, this is it's basically how to solve collective actions, uh, action problems using, using computing. There's a lot of progress on that, using other people's compu computers, going cloudless, um, you know, lots of consensus-based um, infrastructure, new ways of using peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So I really think that this is key to enabling us to build better, more powerful infrastructures that are more user agency friendly. Um, 
there's a lot of work on governance. It's insane the amount of work on governance, governance innovation. Uh, you know, we tend to think of that. We've been doing governance for like, what, 25 centuries, probably way more, but we don't have traces of, of what happened before much. Um, but, you know, there's still innovation going there. The same way that cryptography has been going on for centuries and we're still innovating. Um, this is just a list of, pro of projects from just one uh, area, Metagolf, which I, I particularly like. Um, and, and so they, 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 there's really a lot of innovation happening, happening there. Um, it's quite helpful. Um, and, you know, why am I talking about this at an IPFS conference? Well, it turns out that the principles that, that IPFS um, operates on work really well with the web, content addressing, the kind of robustness that we get. Um, it really enables the, this kind of like self-certified model um, that, we can, that we can use to push the web forward. Uh, so there's, there's a great potential. It's hard to, as Dietrich was saying, it's hard to merge the two. But like using IPFS as a new primitive on the web is quite powerful. And of course, you know, the rest of this track and the rest of this conference um, is so wonderful that I wanted to use a different color to make it brighter. Um, and so no, but really seriously, there's a lot going on here that shows how these two worlds can intersect. And uh, you know, next time I really hope to, to, to use all of that to bring a demo um, of, of these ideas uh, more concretely implemented. And, you know, with that in mind, I think it's time to micropark the funk out of everything and, you know, move forward with web liberation. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Questions later. Oh, Boris is threatening to ask a question. All right, make it Can I do a question? One question, fast. More of a comment. Okay, great. What's next? How do we do it? <laughs> Actions to take. Um, <laughs> that's not a short question. Um, so, but so, I, I really think that this uh, this tile primitive of using IPFS with like strong security constraint to show web content that cannot phone home, that can only work on the client, and then can be composed using um, um, uh, the intents. Um, is is promising. Uh, we'll have to hack on it to make sure that it works. But I really think that there's a there there. And so in my mind, the next step is to hope iterate and hack on that. I know Fabrice has been doing work on it. it you're probably showing some of that, right? Yeah, so he's going to be showing some of that. Uh, but yeah, I want to keep hacking on that and all the infrastructure that goes with. Hashtag, how do we follow up? Where do we stop you? Uh, here. I, let, let, I mean, <laughs> let's let so browsers and platforms, Slack channel. I'm on the internet. Um, you can find me on the on the Mastodon thing, on the on the Twitter thing, Burgeon.com. Uh, but though, but like, come come talk to me. Let's figure out. I have very little to share. I have I have like a huge draft document. If you want to read some unreadable fifteen thousand words, um, uh, but like any idea you have in this space, absolutely happy to collaborate. Thank you very much.